Welcome. Today we're looking at a protocol that just seems wrong on its face. We're talking about hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Right, HHS, it's a life-threatening emergency. You see these extreme blood glucose numbers. I mean, well over 600 milligrams per deciliter. And it comes with this profound dehydration, but, and this is key, usually not the severe ketoacidosis you'd see in DKA. Exactly, and that's where the paradox comes in. It is. A patient comes in with a blood sugar of, say, 1,000. Your first instinct, your training, screams, give insulin. And that's the instinct you have to fight. Our sources are all very clear on this, that common sense reaction is not just wrong, it can be absolutely catastrophic. So we're going to unpack the four reasons why you must delay insulin and why something else has to come first. This isn't just about glucose control. It's not. It's about fundamental physiology. The true emergency here is fluid balance. It's stabilizing the patient's entire circulatory system. If you don't get that why, you can really harm your patient. Okay, let's start with reason number one. We all get fixated on that high glucose reading, but in HHS, what is the single biggest threat to the patient's life right now? It's the dehydration. The profound systemic dehydration. How profound are we talking? We're talking about a massive total body water loss. You can estimate it at 10, maybe 15% of their total body weight. So for an average adult, that's what? 8 to 12 liters of fluid? At least. And that level of deficit leads directly to one thing. The collapse of the circulatory system. Hypovolemic shock. But even if the glucose is 900, the body can handle that for a short time. It can. It's under stress but it can manage. What it cannot survive, what no one can survive, is not having enough blood volume to maintain pressure and perfuse the vital organs. So circulatory failure is the primary target. It's the only target at first. If you don't secure the circulation, nothing else you do is gonna matter. Okay, so if we're delaying insulin because the real threat is shock, what's the first line treatment? What does the standard of care demand we do immediately? The protocol is clear. Immediate and aggressive fluid resuscitation. You have to restore that intravascular volume fast. And I think what's important for you to remember is that giving fluid isn't just a preparatory step. It's an active treatment for the hyperglycemia itself, Precisely. right? Precisely. Pushing fluid starts lowering glucose in a few different ways. First, there's simple dilution. Makes sense. Then you improve blood flow to the kidneys so they can start dumping all that exome glucose. And you improve tissue perfusion, which helps the cells take up some of that circulating glucose. So clinically, how does this start? What bag are we hanging first? The first intervention is always intravenous isotonic saline. That's your 0.9% sodium chloride. Now the goal here is just volume. That's it. We are just trying to refill the tank, you right. know, refill the blood vessels to get that blood pressure stable, nothing else. And then after maybe an hour or two, once the pressure is better, the protocol changes, we switch fluids. Why? Right. Then you move to a hypotonic saline, usually 0.45%, maybe 0.75% sodium chloride. And that's because the initial problem is volume, but the bigger problem is total body water loss. Exactly. The patient has a huge free water deficit. Their cells are desiccated. If you just kept pumping in isotonic saline, you wouldn't be fixing the cellular dehydration. The hypotonic saline provides that needed free water. So it's a gradual rehydration of the cells themselves over the next 24 to 48 hours. A very gradual rehydration. You have to do it slowly to avoid rapid drops in osmolality. You're monitoring labs every couple of hours. It's a delicate balance. Okay, this brings us to the core of the paradox. Reasons two and three. For anyone still thinking a sugar of 1,000 needs insulin, let's talk about how that high sugar is actually, for a moment, protective. This is what we can call the protective paradox. It's reason number three. In this severely dehydrated patient, that huge concentration of glucose in the blood creates a powerful osmotic effect. It's acting like a sponge, pulling water out of the cells and holding it inside the blood vessels. It's an osmotic dam. That's a good way to think of it. That high osmolality is the only thing holding that last bit of precious water inside the circulatory system. It's temporarily propping up the blood pressure. Without that dam, the patient would have crashed even sooner. Much sooner. Okay, so that leads directly to reason number two. Yeah the danger of breaking that dam too quickly. What happens when we give insulin too early? Well, when you give insulin, it acts like a key. It unlocks the cells and glucose rushes out of the bloodstream. And with the glucose goes the osmotic pull, the dam breaks. The dam breaks and fast, the blood's osmolality just plummets. And water, following that new osmotic gradient, flees the bloodstream and rushes into the now relatively more concentrated cells. So the fluid we were trying to keep in the vessels 
It's gone. It's gone. In a patient who is already on the brink of shock, this sudden fluid shift is the final push. It causes severe, often irreversible hypotension. You're basically completing the job the dehydration started. You are. And this also dramatically increases the risk of blood clots, thromboembolic events, because what's left of the blood becomes even more concentrated and sludgy. It's a catastrophic chain of events. The message could not be clearer. Stabilize the system, then fix the numbers. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have, we've given fluids for an hour or two, the blood pressure is stable. Now what? What are the rules for safely starting insulin? The approach has to be low and slow. It has to be a highly controlled, continuous intravenous infusion. And what's the one thing you absolutely do not do? You never, ever give an initial loading dose. An insulin bolus is explicitly forbidden. Because that would just cause the same rapid osmotic shift we've been talking about? Even with some fluids on board, yes. It's too fast, too aggressive. Can you give us an idea of the specific dosing? Just how cautious is this? For an adult, a common starting rate is around 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. For kids, it's even more cautious, something like 0.025 to 0.05 units per kilogram per hour. You're constantly titrating based on the response. And what is the goal here? We're not aiming for a normal blood sugar anytime soon, are we? No, absolutely not. The target for glucose reduction is a slow, steady decline. You're aiming to drop it by about 50 to 75 milligrams per deciliter each hour. And if it drops faster than that? If it's dropping faster than, say, 100 milligrams per deciliter per hour, you have to decrease the infusion rate immediately. And why is that slow reduction so critical even after we've started to restore volume? This is reason number four. It is. This is all about protecting the brain. The biggest fear here is cerebral edema brain swelling. OK, how does that happen? The brain is very sensitive to osmotic changes. If you drop the plasma osmolality too quickly with insulin, it falls much faster than the osmolality inside the brain cells can adjust. So the bloodstream becomes less concentrated than the brain. All right. And water, again, follows that gradient. It rushes into the brain cells, causing them to swell. That leads to cerebral edema, herniation, permanent brain damage, and often death. The slow, controlled reduction gives the brain time to catch up. It gives the brain time to adjust its own internal environment, to equilibrate. It prevents that dangerous fluid shift. So when do you finally stop the intravenous insulin? You continue the infusion until the glucose level has come down to a more stable range, maybe around 250 to 300 milligrams per deciliter. And at that point, you can switch to subcutaneous shots. Not quite. At that point, you actually add dextrose or DeFi to the intravenous fluids to prevent the sugar from dropping too low. Then you can start planning the transition to subcutaneous insulin. Yeah. But you have to keep the IV drip running for at least an hour or two after the first shot to ensure there's an overlap. To prevent a rebound? To prevent that rebound hyperglycemia, yes. So the ultimate takeaway here is pretty profound. The management of HHS forces you to prioritize stabilizing the patient's hemodynamics overcorrecting the number on the screen. It's a perfect example of treating the pathophysiology, not the lab value. You have to correct the profound dehydration first. Everything else follows from that. We hope this really helps you understand the why behind this protocol so you can choose the right tool at the right time. Because sometimes the most obvious solution giving insulin for high sugar is truly the most dangerous one. So we'll leave you with this final thought to consider. Imagine your patient with HHS also has a history of severe congestive heart failure. How does that comorbidity, that risk of flash pulmonary edema, change how you approach that initial aggressive fluid resuscitation? How do you balance the need to fill the tank with the risk of flooding the engine? That's the real art of medicine, right? Applying these protocols to the unique physiology of the person right in front of you.